So let's try this again. So I'm working on introducing diversity on the blockchain layer and the end goal would be to change Ethereum but also other blockchains themselves to enforce diversity on that level. Um, as said, I'm working for the Vega protocol. That's a derivative uh, trading platform that works on its own blockchain. If you want to know what exactly Vega does, there's a wonderful workshop tomorrow where you can spend one and a half hours um, playing with it. Um, I'm talking about the lower level, so I'm doing blockchain research, MEV, fairness, and yes, diversity. In our case, Tendermint, but it's an approach that works everywhere and should also work on Ethereum. And that's the goal to have a discussion with Ethereum developers. How car far can we drive this to put um, diversity onto the blockchain? Um, so generally, why do we need validator policies? In the old days when Bitcoin started, we had this beautiful anarchic cyber point, uh, uh, punk uh, point of view that we have millions of validators in their dorm rooms uh, securing Bitcoin. Uh, that used to work, but now validating is a serious business and that has uh, caused dependencies, that has caused uh, centralization factors. So some of the basic assumptions we had are wrong and Anna has just shown there's some very few validators that own an enormous amount of the Ethereum share, um, share, so it's not really that decentralized anymore. So there's a couple of policies and some other work that I also would like to advertise as people actually thinking about a structural way to figure out what actually do we want from validators. The bad thing is if you start with the same axioms, you may end up somewhere totally differently, so um, this still needs a lot of debate. But one thing that I think nobody needs to debate anymore is we need more diversity and centralization or an undiverse system is, is a very bad idea. And um, if we don't have enough examples, so from other blockchains, Bitcoin at some point uh, had a vast majority of the mining capacity in China. So if China had not said, you guys use too much energy, get out. If they had just said, get out and leave your rigs here, then China would now own Bitcoin. Pretty bad idea. Um, Ethereum has a similar problem that there's no so much validation power in America that the United States has essentially said um, Ethereum is now a US citizen, so we have legislation over you. So congratulations, Ethereum, you're now a citizen of the United States. Um, we had other diversity problems, um, early Ethereum testnet, 75% of the uh, um, validators had uh, client code, there was a bug in there, the whole thing stopped. Um, Solana, almost 40% of all validators run in the same Amazon cloud, so if Amazon goes down, then so does Solana, that's not really diversity. And if you go all the way back in uh, history, Leslie Lamport, who actually invented the term Byzantine Agreement, already said um, the whole threshold model just doesn't make sense. That's not what I meant when I said Byzantine. So we're even using his term in a totally different way than it was originally intended by assuming failure independence. So we need to assume failures happen dependently. States fail, implementations fail, um, flashbots may fail or behave in a bad way. So we need definitely more diversity on the chain. Um, one controversy in there, and that's a discussion that pretty much always comes up when talking about this topic, um, how about enforceability? So if I say I want geographic um, diversity, a validator can just lie about where they are. And that's true, they can, they can use a VPN, so I can be in China and claim I'm in the US, no problem there. So there's a couple of things, so A, just because I can't 100% enforce a policy doesn't mean I shouldn't have it. I have door locks at home, I have friends who can pick those door locks, but that doesn't mean I remove my locks and put my valuables on the street. They still serve a purpose even though they're just 95% uh, secure. And we, if we create a business case that at least honest people create diversity and dishonest people at least have some risk and need to show some criminal behavior um, to vi uh, violate diversity, then we have something. It's not perfect, but just giving up because we say somebody can lie about where they are, that doesn't really help. And there's some really fun research on finding out where you really are, even if you're in a VPN and you probably, if you ask Netflix or Amazon, they're also pretty good at that. 
Um, so it's a discussion that needs to be had, but my opinion is even if we cannot 100% be sure about what a validator says, who they are, what codes they run, where they are, that doesn't mean we should just go home and say, well, then we all end up in China, fine, and we can just uh, stop the whole thing. Um, the way we normally do this, or the first idea to implement policies is by economy. Um, so Ethereum is very um, heavy on slashing. If you mis misbehave, we may slash you, so you better be a nice validator. We can have positive incentives like a diversity award. If you run your validator from New Zealand, we give you more money. Or something indirect like a delegated proof of stake. If you add diversity to the network, you're a good citizen, more people stake to you, you get more money, everybody is happy. Um, that has a couple of problems. Um, my favorite one being MEV, I mean, have to mention MEV here. Uh, with MEV, we don't know what the business model of the validator is anymore. They don't make money by fees, they make money by MEV extraction. So paying them a diversity bonus is like paying police a small bonus in a country where they live off generally of bribes. Um, that's not their business model to get their salary. Their business model is getting bribed, so economic incentives may not really work. Uh, we have fun financial instruments where can outsource flushing risks. Um, and if it's just economics, then I have a higher incentive to cheat. So it's one approach. Um, it definitely is one uh, error in our toolkit, but it's not uh, the end solution. So that's why we want to um, implement diversity on the consensus protocol itself. And to get there, I need a little bit background on consensus protocols. And um, there you see how old I am, because uh, this is papers from 1984. So the impossibility results probably predate everybody in this room, or almost everybody. Um, and the worst one is it's actually bugging the whole community since uh, 40 years by now. Um, it's called Fischer Lynch Patterson, and they proved that consensus is actually impossible. The end, um, let's all go home. Um, what they more precisely proved is no deterministic asynchronous protocol can uh, guarantee termination even if one uh, validator may crash. And this is a result we've been working around for the last 40 years. So this is the reason why every consensus protocol is a bit messy, because if it were easy, we would run into an impossibility result. Uh, there's others, you can actually write papers with thousand impossibility results in the area, which are very fun read, but that's actually the most fundamental one. Now, of course, we can cheat, we have cheated, that is why we're all here. Um, the first way to cheat is, uh, it says asynchronous, so if you use a timing assumption, you get, uh, can get around it. Um, this is what Tendermint is doing, for example. The bad thing is, if you guess uh, your timing assumption wrong, uh, then bad things happen, you get very inefficient. Um, the second one is pluralistic. It says deterministic protocol, so that's actually my favorite approach. Uh, we just terminate with probability one, which is generally good enough, and then I don't need a timing assumption, or what was uh, invented by Bitcoin, essentially, and is now also partially used by Ethereum. Uh, why terminate in the first place if I have a longest chain protocol? I just run it. At some point, it's good enough, but technically, you never really terminate. Now, after the merge, you do, but technically a longest chain protocol never finalizes, you always could theoretically roll back your transactions. So this is the three ways we got around this that gets us to uh, the consensus map. Uh, so we have essentially three approaches. We have the randomized approach, the um, partial synchronous approach, and the longest chain approach. And they all have nice uh, properties. So the both committee-based ones are finalizing, which is great. Um, different timing assumptions. Their disadvantage is they don't scale as well as the longest chain protocol. Every validator there needs to talk to everybody. So if I try to run those protocols with 40,000 uh, validators, um, everything will explode. So this is why people still use longest chain. Uh, now the reason why I'm actually going to all of this, um, the technique I'm now talking about is actually very well explored for the two committee-based protocols. We know exactly how it works there. Uh, for longest chain protocols, um, like the old Ethereum, Bitcoin, um, Solana, we sort of can make it work, but we probably need some more statistical evaluation to be sure what we're doing. And for Gasper, uh, well, we, we need to talk because Gasper is a pretty complex beast. 
it works there. I'm just not sure nothing explodes if you would implement it. So this is uh, where well, it would be a very good idea to actually have a small discussion. Um, so what we want to do is um, call generally adversary structures. So normally, as you saw in these protocols, you have thresholds like only one third of the uh, um, validators may be corrupt or in longest chain half of them. And we want to get rid of this. So forget about thresholds, they are boring. What we want to do is write down explicitly all coalitions of adversaries I want to be able to tolerate uh, if they are corrupt simultaneously. So I could say I want to tolerate if a quarter of all stake plus an entire country goes corrupt, independently on how many validators are in this country. And for now, I just write down these sets and say this is the sets I want to tolerate. Um, it's a pretty flexible notion. We can later scale it down to make it more manageable. Um, then we want to modify the protocols to work with this. And um, unfortunately, we also have some requirements. We can't just say, I want to tolerate everybody going bad. So there's some, some limits what we can do in there. And if we look at the uh, committee-based protocols or also the Casper part of um, Ethereum, you usually find somewhere in the code something like wait for 2t plus 1 or 2f plus 1 votes. So this is where the thresholds come in. And in pretty much every modern protocol, there's exactly three thresholds they use. It's n minus t um, for n validators and up to t traitors, 2t plus 1 and t plus 1. If you now go back in the protocol and if they say t plus 1, what do they actually mean with this? What do they want from this property? Um, we have three things we need. We have a threshold where if I talk to that many, val many validators, I know at least one is honest. Um, honest majority or this is the longest I can wait before I can't wait anymore because everybody else may be corrupted. So this way we now can replace the thresholds with actually sets. So the T plus one is replaced by any set on my list of people I want to be corrupted plus one more guy. And for the committee-based protocols, we can just essentially take the thresholds out of the protocol replace it with our set properties, and we have pretty much automatically transformed that protocol into a more flexible model. Um, we can do the same for the proofs, although it's probably a good idea to manually check the proof afterwards. But we can generically take a protocol that is threshold-based and go to set-based uh, version, which is then much, much more flexible, which allows us to explicitly write down, I want to tolerate all of these people going bad. And um, there's some limits. So the limit we need for um, committee-based protocol, we used to have a third of the validators can be bad. Now it's three of the sets I write down um, must not cover the whole set of validators. So if I say I have three countries and I want all, one of them to be able to corrupt it, doesn't work. If I say I have four countries and I want to tolerate if one entire country goes down, that works. So that's our limits um, on, on the sets. Um, it's necessary and sufficient. So we know if I satisfy this condition, I can still solve consensus. If I doesn't, it's impossible. So this is how we can compute what are, what are the sets we actually can generate. Um, how do we define actually how, who, who we want to tolerate to be corrupted. Uh, longest chain protocols are slightly different. They don't have a threshold. The thing we have here is um, a leader selection algorithm and the longest chain rule. Um, so what we can do here is change the um, definition of what a longest chain is. So if I have, say, consecutive blocks generated in America, I can say the w length of each block goes down in the longest chain uh, depending on the number of uh, blocks that were generated in the same set before. So First block generated by an American validator has length one. Second block generated by an American validator has length 0.95. Third block is going down 0.8 something. So the more blocks are generated by validators in the same corruption set, or say in the same country in this case, the shorter they get. So at some point, just anybody go coming from another country will be longer because they just can't add to the chain anymore. Um, so we can use this approach to also secure a longest chain protocol and have um, uh, these corruption sets on a longest chain base. Um, parameter choice is, um, is still a little bit difficult. Um, this is where we need experimentation. 
that's a general problem with uh, protocols like, with all long chain protocols like Bitcoin, like old Ethereum, that there's a lot of guesswork. So right now we have um, how many um, steps do I need until I actually trust that my block is sort of final. Um, it is guesswork, it's statistical evaluation, so this is what we need to redo now if you want to go to these uh, generalized adversary sets. Um, Gasper is getting even more complex because it's a hybrid protocol. Um, so as I said, I think I can put this into Gasper. I could implement it in Gasper, but um, given the analysis of it is uh, relatively complicated, we have no idea um, if the security proof still holds, so this is then future work. Put it into Gasper and then redo the security analysis. Is Gasper still secure in the new model? And the last thing that's important is how do we manage the sets? So we have a very um, flexible way now to deal uh, with validators, which is actually too flexible. So what we want is actually an attribute based one. And I used this already in my examples, so I used countries. What we want to say is I want a quarter of the stake to fail plus one country plus one implementation plus maybe one cloud provider plus flash bots. Um, and Zema, if we define it by Zema, these attributes, we give all the validators attributes, we can compute the, the corruption the sets from saying I want an entire country to fail. We can Paul, compute back what is Paul the set that we are implementing in our Antonio. algorithm. And then our algorithm can ensure that I not only can tolerate half of the validators to fail or third, but in addition, an entire country, an entire code base, um, uh, an entire flash bots client, uh, whatever. Um, the problem in here is, and I guess it's an issue with all diversity implementations, the more attributes I have along which I, I want to be diverse, the more validators I need to actually implement it. So it's easy to say I want to tolerate an entire country to fail. Saying a country plus an implementation is probably doable. Adding a cloud provider, then it's getting messy. So the more attributes we have along which I want to be diverse, the more difficult it is to actually get, um, get that implemented. And I guess that's the same also in normal diversity in real life. If I have a board of a company and I say I want more women on, on the board, um, that's fine. If I also want different ethnicities, um, handicaps, whatever, then at some point I need a very, very big board to accommodate all of this. Um, so the danger we have here is that we need to avoid minority stacking. That the validators say, great, I have one validator that represents all minorities on the planet. So it's its own operating system, a uh, uh, client nobody else uses, located in Vatican State. Um, so such a validator may get an undue weight in the system if you're not careful how we define our sets. But in general, what that gives us now is I can give validators attributes and rather than saying a third of the validators can fail, I can say everybody with a certain attribute is allowed to fail and the discussion we need to have as a community is then what attributes are actually important. Is it more important to have geographical diversity? Is it more important to have client diversity? Where do we want to set the priorities and which diversity aspects actually in the end less important? So that's my parting summary already. So plain blockchain implementations um, are getting serious diversity errors. We have a huge number of examples. Economic incentivization does sort of work, um, but it has its limits due to new financial tools, due to different um, business models of validators. Uh, we have a tool that we can put things onto the consensus level, um, that we can enforce diversity properties on that level. We know how to implement this for some protocols. Um, this is proven, this works. Ethereum is a bit more complex. It can be implemented, but we still need a security proof. And the last thing is we can also calculate the limit on how diverse we actually can be. So we have a mathematical way to prove this is the maximum amount of diversity I can get via the consensus layer. If that's enough, that's fine. If we need more, then we need to sit back and maybe combine consensus with economic incentives or really go back to the drawing board. But we can complete, uh, precisely calculate now what kind of level of diversity can we have. Um, 
and the legal question that comes up, um, which was also essentially one of the new motivations with, American, uh, with Ethereum now being American, does it actually also help to give us a legal document uh, argument? Does it just make us technically more secure? Or are we also now legally more secure by saying, well, there are no blocks that can create, be created only in America. I always need non-American validators, so Ethereum cannot be um, under complete American law. But that's probably the wrong crowd to answer this, but uh, interesting questions in there. So, um, thank you. Thank you very much for the first We have room for two questions. Hey, great talk. Um, clearly a lot to think about in terms of diversity, and it's not as clear as just, you know, more clients or more countries or whatever. Um, do you have any thoughts on you know, things like Lido that are building their own node operator sets and are, you know, taking it upon themselves to kind of build their own set in the way that they see a diverse set looking. Um, you know, there's some people that say, oh, it's so great that we have so many home stakers, but like you kind of mentioned, you know, a lot of people might not be staking their own infrastructure, they might just be running on AWS. So do you have any thoughts on like how we can kind of economically ensure that there are diverse sets, and you know, do you have any thoughts on people that are going ahead and doing this themselves, like Lido? Well, one thing with this approach, we could actually say that Lido is in an adversary set where we need blocks uh, to be generated by not Lido on a very frequent basis, so they can't completely take over. They have an upper bound on how much control they can have. Um, the approach generally isn't economical, so if it makes a lot of monetary sense to centralize, this is not stopping it. It just gives you less weight. So um, the more people are joining Lido, the more weight in the consensus uh, people get that did not. Um, you can link this with an economic incentive. So if you also um, uh, use the same approach for the leader selection uh, algorithm, then you can also say, um, the validators that add diversity get more block proposals, so they make more money, so that's at some point also an economic uh, limit on how centralized you can be. So it probably would be a combination that both by consensus enforcement, you say I need validators that add diversity, but they also would earn more money, so after a certain size, it just doesn't pay off to grow, any, uh, grow much more. So it can be implemented. The only problem, again, is if you have too many X's among we want to be diverse, then we run into issues of um, implementability. All right. Thank you so much. We are headed for the next talk. Oh, is there any one more question? Maybe we have room for one last. There you go. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, is this for Ethereum also applicable for distributed validators? Like, I, th I think it will be difficult to get the eh? Ethereum community around having something that is not cryptographically um, sure, um, cryptographically um, <coughs> you know, assert that it validators in a certain country. But what I think where this could maybe apply, uh, could be applied for distributed validators. Like their SSV networks or Opal or Paris working on? Uh, haven't thought about that yet. So, probably you could make it on a second level. Um, I, I would still hope that it gets into Ethereum, even if we don't know exactly where somebody is, that we prefer semi perfect policies over 100% cryptographically assured ones. Um, I don't see a reason why it couldn't be used with distributed validators. Uh, maybe it gets a little bit diff uh, more difficult to define than the policies on if, if you have two levels. I mean, it's a similar thing already, which is a problem that hasn't been completely solved yet. In Ethereum, I have two protocols that both have different thresholds and those different sets. So how, how do I combine this? I think if I get in a distributed validator, I get a third one. Uh, should be solvable. I don't see a fundamental problem, but definitely needs to be worked out what that means and if the proof still goes through. So the main thing is you need to still prove everything still works and that's a part that is still a lot of work. Well, big round of applause for Kyle. Thank you so much. <laughs>